Uh, good afternoon, my name is Joel Graff, and we're going to talk today about engineering open source, or the future of engineering software. And I realize, I didn't think about this going into it, but I'm an engineer in the more traditional, uh, in the more traditional professions, the ones that existed prior to the digital computer. And I realize that when engineering is thrown around here, especially at a Linux conference, that's typically not what people are referring to. So I'm talking about engineering in the more traditional sense and how open source applies to that or why it doesn't. Uh, but before we get into it, I want to talk a little bit about myself. I, am a, I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, and I am a licensed professional engineer in the state of Illinois. I'm a husband and father of two sons. My wife, Nicole, and my sons, Mike and Silas, are here with us today. And this year, I did something I've never done before. I founded a company. I started a company called Think Open LLC. Uh, and the reason I did that is because I love open source. I, I, I love to advocate for the use and the adoption of open source. And I've kind of realized that the best way to do that is to advocate for its use and adoption right where I live. And so I've begun looking for opportunities to do that in the area where I live, which is more blue collar than anything. There isn't a whole, there isn't really a tech culture to speak of. Uh, so you're kind of starting from scratch in that sort of culture. Uh, and I, I really didn't expect to have much success, but strangely enough, I've actually been finding opportunities. And one of them, I'm working with a local community college where we're taking uh, computers that have been retired from the community college lab, labs and where they would normally be sold on a sale for 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks a CPU. We're reserving those and we're going to bring in kids from the community who don't have computers at home and we're going to bring them in and, and set these computers in front of them and partly disassemble them and let them assemble them so they learn how a computer works, have them install Linux on them and set them up. And for the price of tuition when they're done, they get to take those computers home. Because we didn't, I never really realized this, but in our community, we have a, a significant number of families who don't really have access to computers. I never really appreciated that until I started working with the people at the community college. Uh, and, and the whole reason I'm mentioning this is because uh, I know I'm talking to a room full of people that love open source. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. And if you're the sort of person who likes to advocate for it and really wants to see it being used, I want to encourage you to look for opportunities where you live if you haven't already done so. You might be surprised at what you find. I've come across two in just the last year that I just, I simply wasn't expecting. Um, anyway, what we're talking about, uh, uh, I forget about this. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, my website doesn't have anything on it because I just got things booted. Uh, so there's, there's really nothing to see on the website, but my email, joel at thinkopenllc.co is for real. I do check that. And if you're interested, my LinkedIn uh, down below is, is there as well. So anyway, we're talking today about uh, open source and engineering. And one of the more interesting engineering projects that's out there is the FreeCAD project. And FreeCAD is an open source 3D parametric modeler. Now what makes three, FreeCAD unique is that there really is no other open source project like FreeCAD. There are other open source CAD programs, but nothing that does parametric modeling. And when I say parametric, I'm really juxtaposing that with your more traditional concept of 3D modeling that you see, you know, when you see a, a Pixar movie being made, you know, what you do with uh, 3D Studio Max or Blender. And in those cases, you create a 3D model that's made up of a mesh, of vertices connected by edges that, that create faces that you then apply materials to to create a, a shiny, beautiful, pretty 3D model. In those cases, if you want to adjust that model, you have to go in and push, pull, and, and manipulate those vertices to change the model. With a parametric modeler, as a very simple, almost trivial example, let's say I want to create a cylinder in 3D. I tell, the, I tell the modeler, create a cylinder. It knows how to create a basic cylinder. Then I say, change the length of that cylinder from 10 units to 15, and it'll adjust the cylinder for me. Or change the diameter from five units to 10. In other words, I don't actually manipulate the mesh. I let the software build the mesh for me, and then I just change a parameter that relates to a dimension of that mesh, and it will automatically readjust. Uh, another example, let's say I'm creating a mesh of a bicycle tire and it has 50 spokes in it. If I realize, oh, I wanted 40 spokes and not 50 in that, in Blender, I would have to go in and rebuild the spokes. But in, in, some, in a parametric modeler like FreeCAD, as an extreme simplification, of course, but in a parametric modeler like FreeCAD, I would just have a parameter called number of spokes and change it from 50 to 40 and it would rebuild for me. So that's the beauty of parametric modeling and it's especially useful in engineering where we speak in terms of parameters and equations and things like that. We don't want to deal with meshes. We're not artists. We're engineers. So FreeCAD is a parametric modeler, and its immediate competition on, would be mostly on the commercial side with Autodesk um, SolidWorks 
or Fusion 360 if you've heard of those packages. And I'm not saying that it competes well with them in its current state, but that's its competition if we want to speak in those terms. Uh, FreeCAD was also born in Germany in uh, 2000, oh, 2002, 2004, the, the date escapes me. But what's good, about it, what's good about it is that the three original developers that began this project are still with it today. That's a really solid project. It's been around for a long time, and it's, it, and it's starting to see a lot of rapid development just in the last few years. So the FreeCAD, uh, the FreeCAD uh, project is based on the Open Cascade Geometric Kernel. This kernel is licensed under the L LGPL, but it's also commercially supported, so it's stable. It's not going anywhere. And that's where all of your geometric operations uh, take place. It's fully parametric from the ground up, and that's significant because there are commercial packages out there that claim to be par parametric CAD that are actually built upon 2D or, or 3D CAD systems that are not parametric by default. So the parametric tools are being pushed down on top. It doesn't work that well. So it's important to note that FreeCAD is parametric from the ground up. Par uh, FreeCAD is built on the concept of modular workbenches. This enables FreeCAD to be used to model things that was never intended by the original developers. Uh, so for example, my history or my background is in highway design. So if I wanted to use FreeCAD to do 3D highway design, because believe it or not, that's a thing these days, uh, I could sit down and I could build a workbench that contained tools focused on 3D highway design. And as a matter of fact, I've, over the last couple of years that I've been involved with the project, we have been working on something like that. Uh, this is very similar to the way Blender works. Both, uh, both applications are C++ frameworks with Python scripting backends. If you've used Blender, if you're familiar with that, you know that a lot of the tools that you run when you click on a button in the Blender interface actually runs a Python script in the background. And if you want to, you can change that script or write your own script that then is driven directly in the Blender interface. That's the same idea that you get with FreeCAD workbenches. FreeCAD also supports a wide variety of 3D data formats. The basic idea is that if you have 3D data in a format that is supported by, say, a Python library, you can get it into FreeCAD. And once you get it into FreeCAD, you can do a lot of things with that. You can visualize it in 3D, you can put surfaces on it, you can uh, merge it with other models, you can export it to different formats. It's actually a very powerful, good feature for FreeCAD. FreeCAD also uh, supports CNC milling G-code. Uh, CNC milling is this process whereby you, you take a, a stock raw material and you cut shapes out to form more complex objects. Um, and very often you're talking about things like plasma cutters or laser cutters that are cutting uh, steel sheets uh, or wood sheets. And in order to do that, to guide those cutters, there's a thing called G-code. And this is the programming language, if you will, of CNC mills. So you can design your shapes in FreeCAD and it will generate the G-code which gives or provides the paths for the CNC mill cutter to follow and then you just push that to the mill and it'll do its job. FreeCAD also supports 2D sheet support. So if you create a structure or a component in 3D, you can generate those, uh, those two-dimensional plan engineering views uh, directly from your model in FreeCAD. FreeCAD also has initial support for 3D rendering. This is a recent thing. There is an internal renderer, I think. Uh, we're also working to integrate some external renderers uh, it's, it's still in development, it's not perfect, but it is there. And we also have a thing called an integrated spreadsheet. This is kind of a neat tool. So what this means is that instead of having to have a separate window with uh, LibreOffice Calc or even Microsoft Excel open, you can have the integrated spreadsheet open inside FreeCAD. And what's nice about that is that you can link the cells in the spreadsheet to the parameters in the model. So as I'm sitting there in the spreadsheet and writing formulas to uh, recalculate values of, of the model parameters, it will automatically update the model itself. So the model will literally resize as you change numbers in the spreadsheet. It's kind of fun to do. The current status of the FreeCAD project. Our latest release is 0.17. Don't be fooled. It, the version number is, I know it looks very alpha, but it's just a number. I think Linus Torvalds has said that a number of times. It's just a number. We released FreeCAD uh, in February of 2018. 017 was released in February of 2018. The development version, uh, the, eight, uh, the 018 release candidate, is well under development. We're actually approaching feature freeze for that. It will be released hopefully in February of 2019. We are trying to get on an annual release cycle so that uh, we can align our releases of FreeCAD with the Debian repository so we can get uh, the latest FreeCAD downstream to the Ubuntu community. Uh, in 018, we will be supporting Python 2 and Python 3 side by side as Python 2 sunsets in 2020. Then at, in 019, Python 2 will be gone, it'll be Python 3. That represents a mountain of work, uh, just getting Python going. But we're actually doing a very good job getting that taken care of. We're also transitioning from Qt4 to Qt5 for our user interface. 
And since 017 has been released, over 50,000 lines of code has been added to the 018 development release. Um, that's an awful lot for a project the size of FreeCAD. That's really impressive. And there's already a lot of new features and things that FreeCAD 18 can do that, that, uh, that wasn't present in 17. And the other thing is we have a new website, which, I don't know, I get excited about stuff like that. So what do people do with FreeCAD? Well, there's a lot of stuff. And if you go to the FreeCAD forums and you check out the user showcase in the FreeCAD forums, you're gonna see just all the amazing cool stuff that people do with FreeCAD. It's, I, I've spent hours just combing through it and you know, just getting my mind blown by the stuff that's there. This is a good example, the user here, Lemonbug, uh, they're into prosthetics for humans and animals. And one of their projects is to create 3D printable prosthetics for dogs. And as I read the thread, I learned a few things. I learned that traditionally when a dog has a leg amputated, it's removed to the hip. And more recently, veterinarians have become more sensitive to that issue to the point where if they can retain some of the leg, they will. Because it's possible to build a prosthetic so the animal can regain some of their mobility once they've lost part of their leg. And so with that in mind, this user is now creating 3D prosthetics that uh, a 3D model of a, a, an open source 3D model of a prosthetic that can be 3D printed then. Uh, this is another example of, of a model. Uh, I hate to call this typical because it's not, but it, it's, you see stuff like this. You see a lot of stuff like this. And I, 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 this, is, this is why I love going through the user showcase, because you get to see this really cool stuff that people do. It, it just, it's mind blowing. This is an air cooled radial engine. Uh, from a World War I biplane. It was used in the likes of the Sopwith biplanes, like the Sopwith Camel. Uh, and the user that developed this, like I say, there's an intricate amount of detail that you can see in that exploded view that I just, I love to look at. FreeCAD's also good at structural analysis. This is a little more my domain. I'm not a bridge engineer, but I always thought structures was kind of cool. So FreeCAD's really good at structural analysis. And this is actually a finite element analysis of a pedestrian bridge section. I learned how to do finite element analysis in college. Big, ugly, nasty, hairy math. Matrix math. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> the thing is, is I could do it, but I would never care to. And this is why we make software. And this is a finite element analysis of a bridge section. You can see that it's, uh, it's a moment is being applied to the end. It's got a clockwise twisting moment going on. You can see on the left-hand side, uh, the, the, the outer edge of the deck is being pushed upward, bowed outward in sort of a torsion. It's being stretched or pulled. It's under tension. And that's what the red, uh, red part of the heat map there indicates. Then on the other side, you see the section is being compressed downward, pushed together. So it's experiencing compression forces. So finite element analysis is a very effective, accurate way of depicting the forces or the stresses and strains that are put on a structure or a component as it's, as it's loaded by forces external to it. Uh, and it, it, creates, it creates this really nice, very convenient visual heat map of where those stresses and strains are and in what direction they're acting. Uh, it's actually, if finite element analysis has been a part of FreeCAD, I think since, version 12? I don't know, for a long time. There's a lot of open source finite element analysis tools that are out there. Calculix, Elmer are two that come to the top of my head and that are integrated into FreeCAD so that you can run them directly from FreeCAD. Uh, and there's actually a significant list of open source FEM tools that are not yet uh, integrated, but they're on a waiting list. Um, it's, if you go through the wiki, you'll actually see that list. Another thing FreeCAD does well is architecture. York Van Havre is one of the uh, original developers for the FreeCAD project. He's a professional architect. He's an architect by profession out of uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he has spent an awful lot of time developing tools for uh, FreeCAD to make it uh, a very capable architectural tool. Uh, so you, if you take a look at his blog, york.uncreated.net, you'll find uh, he has a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff to various pieces of software. There's a big section devoted to FreeCAD. Uh, he's developed tools that focus on building design using walls, windows, roof elements. So there's a, a good bit of uh, uh, convenience in those features. He's created uh, 2D, uh, just, just like, uh, just like str uh, structures and other components, there is a 2D plan visualization so that when you create a building, you can get floor plans or cross sections of the building quickly and easily. Uh, it'll the, there's the ability to auto-generate bills of materials. 
So you could create a spreadsheet listing all of the materials that have gone into the project and the quantities that are required. Uh, York has just recently worked on integrating IFC support. IFC is, an, uh, if I'm right, an, uh, architecture isn't quite my thing, but if I'm right, IFC is an open data format that supports BIM, building information management, which is pretty big in architecture these days. So by uh, adding IFC support, any models in FreeCAD that are created can be exported uh, and made BIM compatible or BIM ready. And finally, uh, as I mentioned before, early 3D rendering support. The image that you see down on the lower half is not done in FreeCAD. That was a result of exporting the model to Blender and rendering it in Blender Cycles. Uh, what you get in FreeCAD is not going to look that nice. Cycles is a top-notch rendering engine. Uh, but again, we do have some preliminary 3D rendering support that uh, does exist. One of the other projects that York has been focused on is the WikiHouse project. Uh, this is a project to create housing of a modular design that can be assembled with unskilled labor using common materials available just about anywhere in the world. The goal is to create something that can be constructed quickly, simply, and entirely with open source tools. So a preliminary uh, uh, a, a, a demonstration of that project was done a couple of years ago, I think now, down in Brazil. And you can see on the left, there are the structural members that are being put together. They fit together in jigsaw fashion. Like you can put this together with a small team of people in rubber mallets. It's that, it's really that simple. It's in, intended to be that simple. And then on the right hand side, you see the completed structure. And you may look at that and think, oh, that's nice, but it's, I don't know that I'd care to live in that. And you have to understand that that may not be serviceable housing where we live in our cooler northern climates, but in Brazil, that is perfectly serviceable housing given their, given their climates and their conditions. Uh, but other WikiHouse projects have been done, I think, in Europe in more northern climates that are more representative than of, of other, condi other conditions in other climates. Who else uses FreeCAD? Lulzbot. Uh, if you don't know, Lulzbot are the open source 3D printer people. And uh, Lulzbot, several years ago, actually financially contributed to the development of FreeCAD so they could use FreeCAD in their internal uh, design processes. How much they use it now, I, I don't really know. But what I do know is, being an open source 3D printer hardware company, they publish all of their plans for all of their printers online. And I went looking, and yes, I can download the latest Lulzbot printer in FreeCAD's format. So they must use it to some extent. But they have financially supported us in the past. We're big fans. Another group, Open Source Ecology, relies heavily on FreeCAD. If you haven't heard of these guys, they're very interesting. Uh, open Source Ecology was founded by a guy by the name of Marcin uh, Jakubowski. He's a doctorate from Poland. He's, uh, his organization is based here in Missouri. And his goal was to create a global village construction set, what he called the building blocks of civilization. This was a kit of 50 open source machines, bulldozers, tractors, uh, something called a power cube, which I think is a power generator, 3D printers, all these different things that in his mind was necessary to create and sustain a civilization. If we had to start from scratch and we needed machines, what machines would they be? So they created the Global Village Construction Set, and they've been working on it ever since, I think for about 10 years now. They just re, uh, celebrated their 10-year anniversary. And right now, one of their big things are 3D printer workshops. So they go around the country in the US, and they host these 3D printer workshops that last several days. And um, participants come, and they learn how to build a 3D printer from scratch. And I think just a couple of weeks ago, they did a one-day build of a three-foot by three-foot 3D printer. It was really amazing. I saw their posts on Facebook for it. But they have this concept of machines building machines to create a sustainable uh, open source machine construction environment. And they rely heavily on FreeCAD to create these blueprints and designs. And they have some very good tutorials on how to learn how to use FreeCAD. So if you want to check them out, opensourceecology.org is their website. I highly recommend you follow them on Facebook because that's where the real action takes place. That's where you see a lot of the activity. So we can see then that there are a lot of, there's a lot of interesting uses that are developing. And FreeCAD is a stable, powerful tool. It's functional in a production environment. But the question remains, can an open source engineering tool like FreeCAD succeed in an engineering environment that is typically dominated by proprietary commercial software? It's a difficult question to answer, sort of like, the year of the Linux desktop, right? <laughs> I got a laugh out of that. That was good. So can it succeed? And that is. It's a difficult question to answer. But it needs to succeed. And there's some serious reasons for that. And one of the guys that uh, can one of the guys that articulates those reasons well 
is a guy by the name of Dr. Rufus Pollock. He's the founder of the Open Knowledge Foundation. He's got a PhD in economics from Cambridge University, and he's a fellow with the Shuttleworth Foundation, Cambridge University, and a couple others. Dr. Pollock's uh, foundation, the Open Knowledge Foundation, was, was created to preserve knowledge in the public interest, to make sure knowledge which benefits the public and which should be made available to the public is and isn't taken control by proprietary or private interests. And one of the initial goals of his foundation was to deal with pharmaceutical trials. The point being that when a pharmaceutical company creates a new drug, they will commission trials to determine the efficacy of that drug. Now, if those trials are positive, they'll happily publish those results. But if they're negative, well, we might keep that back because we have a shareholders meeting next month, you know? You know how that goes. And of course, if your life happens to depend on that drug, you're gonna wanna know the good and the bad, right? So one of the goals of his foundation was to, and, and they created the uh, Open Trials Project, I think is what it's called, but to get that data and preserve it so that it is publicly available regardless of the reflection on the drug. Uh, he's also the guy who came up with the authoritative definition of open data. All right, so if you, if you wanna know what open data is, you look up the definition, he's the guy that wrote it. Uh, more recently, his organization has been focusing on something that they call the, the global wealth divide. Uh, and it's a, it's a division of wealth on a scale that we've never seen before, and it's been created by none other than the technology that we all know and love. And his point is that the eight wealthiest people in the world have among them over half of the wealth of the poor half of the world. And he says this, this division of wealth where the elites are now, now have an opportunity for the unmitigated acquisition of wealth is growing on a scale like we've never seen. And the reason for that is because we're driving a digital economy with material economics. It's an interesting idea, and he goes on to describe what exactly that means. When we talk about material economics in a digital economy, he says there's three key effects that are contributing to this global acquisition of wealth among an elite few. And that is, first, the platform effect, the second, the effect of costless copies. The third, the effect of intellectual property. Now the first two are actually intrinsic characteristics of a digital economy. These are things that just come with a digital economy. The third is the holdover from the material economy. So when we talk about these, when we talk about the platform effect, a good example is Facebook versus MySpace. How many here had a MySpace account when it was a thing? See, holy cow. <laughs> I didn't care about social media until Facebook was, was it, was the only real option. But at the time when MySpace and Facebook coexisted, and MySpace you know, was still a thing, uh, really the two services weren't that different. They offered a lot of the same features, but there were some minor differences between them. And the reason why MySpace failed is really kind of interesting, because if you ask the former CEO, he'll tell you that MySpace failed because when a user signed up for a MySpace account, they were encouraged to use a pseudonym. Whereas if you signed up with a Facebook account, you use your real name. Now in retrospect, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if I'm gonna be me, I gotta be me. I can't have everybody love me for who I am under a pseudonym, it doesn't make sense. But see, in that day, MySpace adopted the pseudonym approach because, well, people were a little re reluctant about putting their faces and names out there, because you know, Someone might want to come along and abuse that. Of course, that's silly, right? We look on that now, and who would absolutely want to abuse your personal data? <laughs> All the same, though, that risk of putting your real name and real face out there, it, it appealed to the narcissist in all of us, I guess. You know? And now, Facebook is the dominant platform. But note, when we talk about the platform effect, there's a significant difference. This isn't like when I go to someone and say, could you give me a Kleenex? If I ask you for a Kleenex, you'll know what I mean. I need a tissue, right? Well, why do I say Kleenex? Because Kleenex is a dominant manufacturer of tissue paper. If I ask for a Puffs, you'll look at me and say, well, I'll get you what I get you, right? But the fact of the matter is, is if I wanted to go into business for myself making tissue paper, I could compete with Kleenex if I do my marketing right, right? Kleenex dominates the market, perhaps, but I could still compete. Not so in a digital economy. Name for me one successful alternative to Facebook that can take users away from Facebook. I'll give you a hint, it isn't Google Plus. <laughs> if you haven't already figured out, there aren't any. Because in a digital economy with a platform effect, winner takes all, there is no second place. There is no second place, all right? 
That's, and that's a characteristic of a digital economy, and believe it or not, it's not necessarily a bad thing. The second characteristic is the characteristic of costless copies. And when we say costless copies, what we're saying is that when you have a digital product in your hand, you can reproduce it quickly with a click of a button at little or no cost to yourself and distribute it to your friends, okay? I could do that with Windows 10 if I wanted to, as long as I wasn't saying, selling around, sending around activated copies of it, right? I can't do that with a pair of shoes, all right? The physical, you know, in the material world, physical products have a physical presence. They cost time, money, energy, resources to produce. In the digital world, these, pro pro these products are ephemeral. There is no cost to their production and distribution, more or less. The cost of electricity. And this is, this is another powerful advantage of a digital economy. This makes freedom, this, this makes information free for all. This, this, this is a very powerful effect that you see in a digital economy that you can't replicate in a material economy. The third effect is the one that's causing all the problems. Oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh no. You know what happened? I think my battery might have died. Oh no. <laughs> oh, did it come up? Okay. Let's hope my battery doesn't die. Um, so the third effect is the effect of intellectual property. And uh, with the effect of intellectual property, now what you're doing is you're taking the first two digital effects and you are wrapping them up. You're locking them up in the hands of the intellectual property holder. Because what happens when you take a digital product and you apply a, uh, and you apply a, um, a patent to it, you apply intellectual property to it, what you're saying is I will make this a freely available to people under certain terms and conditions, price usually being one of them. And so what happens when, that, when you do that is that certain segments of the market that might benefit from your product immediately lose out. Uh, for example, you know, they may not be able to afford the technology. They may be region locked out of the technology. Or perhaps they want to use the technology in a way that the license won't allow. Or they can't innovate on the technology. If they can get their hands on it, they can't improve it for their own purposes. Right? These are sort of the hallmarks of open source that proprietary differentiates it from proprietary uh, software. The second thing that happens is a lack of transparency, like in the pharmaceutical industry. They want to protect that IP, so they're not going to tell you everything. And third is that the money. If I go to Windows Web, if I go to Microsoft's website, I download Windows 10, I install it on a system. Microsoft's going to charge me over 100 bucks for that activation, right? And when you're selling hundreds of thousands or millions of copies of a piece of software at 100 bucks a pop, how long do you think it takes to recoup your research and development costs for that first copy of Windows 10? Not long. So where does the rest of that money go? It goes to the people who can make Microsoft richer. No offense to Microsoft, but that's where it goes. They go to marketing, right? They go to marketing so Microsoft can expand into different markets or turn around and sell that new Windows 10 activation, user's activation, uh, a, a copy of, I don't know, Microsoft 365 or something, right? So that's, so the problem is, is, it's not saying that intellectual property is wrong, but as a holdover from a material economy where it made a lot of sense to do that, in a digital economy, it's taking the strongest elements of a digital economy and it's locking them up so it serves one and only one entity, the holder of intellectual property, when it should be serving the common good. So there's something wrong in the way intellectual, in, in the way that intellectual property is applied to a digital economy, and that is Dr. Pollock's chief argument. We need to change the way that we go about making money from digital products. We can't continue on the course we've been going on because it's intellectual property that's creating this massive wealth divide where an elite few accumulate uh, more wealth than half the rest of the world. Just trying to keep this alive by using the keyboard. All right, so when we take the digital, the characteristics of a digital economy, the platform effect and the costless copies, and we apply to it the effect of intellectual property, we create this concept of lock-in. And this concept of lock-in is simply that you've created a, a platform that is so easily accessible, so readily available, and meets your needs so well that if you ever try to leave, you're going to find that difficult, if not impossible. Okay? To the point. I invite all of you to go and delete your Facebook account. <laughs> Have you done it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I wish, honestly, I wish I could say I, I could, but I, I just, I'm not there yet. 
fantastic. Consumer Reports, check it out. <laughs> I know I will. But the point of the matter is, is it's one of those things where we all know we, we should give it up, but we can't. And maybe some of us are okay with Facebook accounts. If you're okay with it, great. But, but the point of the matter is Facebook gets a lot of flack in the open source community for, for obvious reasons. And, and it's a great example of how lock-in works. And this is something that we suffer in all domains in technology, but especially we see this in engineering, in the more traditional forms of engineering. So when we talk about this in engineering, we need to understand first what it requires in order to be an engineer today. And uh, when we talk about being an engineer, <laughs> when, we, when we talk about being an engineer today, uh, there's really two things that come into play. First is that if I want to be an engineer today, I have to have competence, and second, I need to have tools. My competence comes to me in the form of schooling, where I go to school, I learn engineering knowledge, and I learn how to apply that to a real world problem. Then I go and I sit for a license to become a licensed professional engineer. And by virtue of that licensure, I signal to the world that not only am I capable of performing engineering, but, but I have the ethics and integrity to ensure that I will not perform my engineering in such a way as to benefit me and thereby risk the life, health, and safety of the public that may depend upon my work. Okay? So licensure is as much about ethics and integrity as it is about knowledge. And it's, a, it's a very important element to engineering. The second half of that is tools. And that is I may be a competent engineer, but I am not a capable engineer without my tools. And so my tools consist of the business structures that we use to, co to perform our engineering activities and the uh, software that we use, which is no small thing. And now traditionally software uh, has played us uh, not that big of a role in terms of at least the more traditional forms of engineering. To give you an example, as a highway design engineer, where I began, uh, 10 years before I began, we started using CAD. What did we do in CAD? We did what we did for years and years by hand. We drew, we drew lines on the screen, right? We drew lines on a page. Was it better? Oh yes, absolutely. We, you were able to reproduce plans quickly. In the end, we were able to design better. It wasn't a wrong thing to do. But in the, it wasn't doing anything different. It was just a different context. Same stuff, different context. By the time I started, we were doing, using software to do uh, geotechnical analysis, structural analysis, hydrological analyses. We were using software to do increasingly complex tasks. But in the end, all this software did was codify the physical rules that govern these problem domains, that govern these models, all right? So in the end, the software wasn't doing anything that we as engineers could not have done for ourselves by hand, what we went to school to learn how to do. It could do it faster, it could do it more accurately, happy to let it do the job, but we could still do it. In other words, we could check the math. In the last five years, though, that's starting to change. Something is happening that's shifting this dichotomy, especially in the, in the way software works, and that is machine learning. Because when we talk about machine learning, we're talking about an algorithm that doesn't care about the physical rules. It only cares about the patterns in the data. So what happens when we start using software like that is we now have software that's using a method that we can't validate as engineers, and that has, a, that has the ability to do a better job at our jobs than we do. But what do I mean by that? Well, as a civil engineer, I might be called upon to design a mix of concrete for a bridge or for a highway in a cold weather climate, in a warm weather climate. Depending on the various purposes and conditions, I might just, you know, adjust the ratios of water and sand and cement and plasticizer and whatever else goes into it. But I'll use the rules of material science to solve that problem. Or I might be, uh, I might be, it might be necessary to create a, a, an estimate for a highway construction project. So I need to know, you know, how much asphalt, how much paint striping, how much guardrail goes into it. And then I need to know, well, what, what's the cost index for labor or for steel or for fuel? And then I'll use the rules or laws of economics to solve that problem. But if I'm using a machine learning algorithm to do that, I'm feeding it concrete mix information. I'm feeding it construction cost information. It's doing its thing and it's spitting out an answer and it's coming up with better answers than I can come up with. And it's a black box to me. I don't know how it's getting there. I can't really check its math. And these aren't just hypothetical situations because I've actually done this. I have designed machine learning algorithms that can do these things better or at least as well as I and other engineers can. Now, is that a problem? Is that a problem that our tools, as engineers, our tools are becoming more competent than we are? Well, some would say it is, others might argue. But the fact of the matter is, is that's the, dire the direction it's going, whether we like it or not. So 
if that's the direction it's going, I would argue it's a problem on, under one condition only, and that is that if we can't check the math, then we must own the tools. What do I mean by that? Well, we live in a culture of vendor lock-in, especially in engineering. When you hear somebody say, I'm a Microsoft shop, I'm an Amazon shop, what does that mean? That means that when we need a solution, we go to our favorite vendor to the exclusion of all others. Vendor lock-in. Because it's too expensive for us to have to adopt another vendor solution and make them talk. Because that's the way they want it, right? If that's the case as engineers, and now we rely on software that's smarter than we are, so to speak, in order to solve problems that we can no longer solve by hand, and we exclusively license this software from a certain vendor, who then, in the end, is responsible for my engineering? Me? Don't do that. Is it me, or is it the software vendor? As an engineer, mentally, I'm going to assign that responsibility to the software vendor. But if that bridge falls in the water or that building falls down, who's going to take the blame? Me or the software vendor? That's right. Under the law and in the eyes of the public, I'm responsible. So as a professional engineer, if I am to bear the responsibility for my engineering activities, I must have ownership of my tools. I cannot allow a company to, ha to, ha to take that responsibility when their priority is not my engineering problem, but their bottom line. And this isn't to demonize proprietary software or demonize private interests. This is just a, a default conflict of interests that, we're, that is going to be increasingly problematic as we move forward into this age where software gains an increasing degree of competence. We need to deal with that. We need to have a way to take ownership of these tools. And this is why open source matters. Because sound engineering should not require exclusively licensing someone else's intellectual property. We should always be able to get the job done without having to pay someone else a specific amount of money to do it. To help make that point a little more clearly, this is the Truesdell Bridge over the Rock River in Dixon, Illinois, where I live. This is the day that it was opened uh, for traffic, I think in 1869. You can actually see the founder of Dixon. Yeah, there we go. You can actually see the founder of Dixon and his wife sitting in their carriage in the middle of the bridge right there. Um, the Truesdell Bridge was designed by an engineer by the name of Lucius E. Truesdell, who had actually built a bridge in Elgin, Illinois, a few years before. And during the construction of this bridge, a couple sections of that bridge fell in the water. Now, the report came back, well, that was, bolts have been loosened, there were substandard construction techniques, whatever it was. The result of that analysis did not impact the construction of this bridge. It was also a single truss design, whereas this was a double. So they felt confident in continuing the construction of this design. And what, when it was done, the people of Dixon were understandably proud of it. In 1869, if you had a bridge that looked like that, you'd be pretty proud too. It was a defining feature of the city. And so life went on for some time until this happened. May 4th, 1873. There was a baptism taking place. It was a Sunday. And a number of people were congregated on the north bank of the Rock River, as you can see where the people are in that picture, on the west side of the bridge. Now, in those days, a baptism was a community event. A lot of people turned out for it. And so a lot of people congregated al along the bank and then up on the bridge on the pedestrian walkway. And some boys climbed up and sat up on top of the truss, you know, with my no hands, that sort of thing, right? That's what kids do. And uh, as the story goes, and you can read a very detailed account of it on Wikipedia, but as the story goes, uh, sometime into the baptism, you could hear this loud crack and bang, and the bridge where it connected to the abutment, the structure that was built into solid ground where it transitioned back to dry land. The bridge cracked at the abutment, and the last section of the bridge fell completely into the water. And it took with it uh, a lot of people. And by the time it was done, 46 people had died, 56 were injured, and most of them were women and children. Now, at the time that this happened, this was, this was one of the largest bridge disasters in U.S. history at that point. And uh, a lot of people thought Lucius Truesdell had since died. It turns out three weeks later, he shows up in Massachusetts, and he writes to the Springfield, Massachusetts newspaper, a newspaper in Springfield, Massachusetts, to defend himself. And he says a lot of things in that. But one of the things he said, and I'll never forget it, was this. He said, it is nearly 18 years since I began building iron bridges. And the Elgin and Dixon bridges are the only ones that have fallen and no loss of life except at Dixon. Can as much be said of any other plan? 
he had three weeks. He breaks his silence to address this atrocity, and he essentially shrugs his shoulders and says, stuff happens. If you disregard the, even if you disregard the callousness of this statement in light of what took place, understand he refused to take responsibility for the design which resulted in the injuries and deaths of over 100 people. Other engineers of his day denounced his plan as unsafe and unfit and should never have been constructed. Lucius Truesdale demonstrated that he lacked the competence in terms of both knowledge and integrity to be an engineer. And so when I stand before you today and I say, I am a licensed professional engineer, understand that means something. Guys like this are why licensure exists. Guys like this are why the engineer bears responsibility for his or her designs. And we need to protect that responsibility moving forward. This is why we need open source in engineering. So what is lock-in costing us today? Well, there are three key areas where we see lock-in. First is proprietary formats and government specifications. What am I talking about? Well, if a government agency wants a consulting firm to uh, create a set of engineering plans, they will often say, we need it submitted in DGN or DWG format. Well, what are these formats? Well, if you know anything about CAD, you know that they are the proprietary data formats of the two leading CAD providers in the United States. And they are not compatible, and that's by design. Now, again, is that their fault? No, that's just a continuation of applying the intellectual property, uh, the, the effect of intellectual property from a material economy to a digital economy. Right? You can't really blame the companies. You can't really blame the government. There's really nobody to blame. It's just that now we are facing the result of an inappropriate use of intellectual property. The proprietary formats of government specifications is a good example because what we are in effect saying is that engineering consultants, if you want to bid on or get this public works project that is funded with taxpayer funds, you must subsidize private vendor X to the exclusion of all others with a substantial sum of money. That's an ethical problem. But again, do we have a choice? No, because we live in a culture of vendor lock-in. It's just the way, that's, this is where intellectual property has brought us. Licensing creates obsolescence. That's another problem, in that when a proprietary vendor serves up software, they will, or they have the right to revoke that license at any time, or upgrade the software and refuse to support whatever version of software you're running. And if you're a small agency, Having, being forced to upgrade can be very expensive. Now, is it necessary? That's debatable. You know, it's understandable in the, in, the, in the business model and everything, it's understandable why it needs to be done, but is it always necessary? Probably not. And the third is that high costs restrict access to smaller agencies, and in that case, I'm talking about county governments or small cities, which may need uh, access to, I don't know, GIS applications, right? And those proprietary commercial applications are expensive. Luckily for them, there's an open source option. QGIS exists, it's just as powerful as its commercial alternative. Unfortunately, that's not the case for most engineering software. So how do we solve this problem? Well, to start, we need to engineer the future with open source in mind, which means governments must take the lead. And I know everybody wants the government out of their business, but we need governments to take the lead. And the reason for this is because nothing affects a nation's economy or policy like its government. That means governments need to adopt an open source first policy, not one which excludes proprietary software, but when searching for a technological solution, considers the open source solution before the proprietary. And maybe even if an open source solution exists which doesn't quite have the features that are needed, they should consider investing in it to get those features done, rather than opting for a proprietary off-the-shelf solution. Second is the GPL protects transparency. So when governments deal with open source software, and I know the GPL is a, is a contentious topic in the open source world and free software world, but the GPL protects transparency in government like nothing else can. Nothing else can protect the transparency or the use of public funds to develop open source software like the GPL and ensure that proprietary interests cannot hijack it or make use of it to their advantage without sharing their code. Finally, we need to subsidize open source. And just by, a, just by making these policy changes, governments can openly subsidize open source without even investing funds. Because when they say we value open source, any commercial technology vendors who want to do business with them are going to have to understand that they need to value open source too. 
Not only that, but private organizations can openly subsidize open source as well. For example, let's say a, a number of uh, engineering consultants got together and pooled all the money that they spend on expensive commercial engineering software every year. And let's say they use that to hire developers who, I don't know, develop some features in the FreeCAD project. How much do you think we could get done if companies spent more time focusing on and making open source a priority rather than defaulting to their favorite vendor, right? And by the way, I'm not saying the FreeCAD guys actually want a ton of money thrown at them. They probably don't. But you get the point. You understand where I'm going. So with that, are there any questions? I don't know how much time we have left. So. Six minutes. We got six minutes. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Open foam, F O A M. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was a slide that I cut out of this just so I could make time. Uh, FreeCAD does support computational fluid dynamics or CFD. Oh, oh. Not, you know what? That's a question that's actually come up in the forums recently under the guise of certification. No, there is, I mean, there's people who have offered that sort of thing for specific purposes but not in a general context, no. But the question has come up recently, how do we, could we provide certification for FreeCAD that would be meaningful to institutions? And they're still kind of working through that, but we could certainly develop a series of tests to test competency. But tutorials and, and training classes, that's, that's a big thing that I can't really address. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, no, and, uh, well, yep, right, uh, countries across the world are recognizing, governments across the world are recognizing open source, I'm sure a lot of us are aware of that. They're recognizing the value of open source from a public perspective, and, you know, the UK government has a huge open source policy. The federal government has a unit which develops in-house open source solutions for other federal government agencies, it's really cool. But you're not seeing that trickle down to you know, state governments or local governments so much because nobody's really aware of it. And in terms of CAD, and I can tell you again from the highway design perspective, right now the CAD solutions for highway design are, are bleeding edge. And there just isn't anything in the open source world. Free CAD is, is the start of that. But there's really nothing in the open source, source world that can develop that, which is why I'm saying governments need to say we value open source before we value proprietary. We need to start putting open source at the front so we can develop those solutions and encourage the development of them. Um, but otherwise, uh, I know there's, I know I've seen individual cases of governments which have, have put open source specifications in there, but they're worldwide cases. You know, there's, you know, like in Italy or France or something like that. Uh, in, in, in the U.S., I'm not really aware of anything specific. I'm sure there's something. Yes, sir. Like, I'm not sure I follow. Mm -hmm. um, I know they've, I know they've exported FreeCAD to a web-based, to WebGL and that sort of thing. There's been some tests on that. Uh, offhand, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Murky water's there, right? <laughs> That's Murky Waters, because when you see one and only one sponsor, you start to think, hmm, something's not good. And then when you get a diversity, then you have a hard time reaching consensus. And, uh, that's. You know, you gotta under, you gotta recognize the nature of the open source project too, because every project's different. Their goals are different. Some are bent on world domination, others just want to make something that doesn't crash, right? You know, it's it's it depends on the open source project. And I'll give you an example for the FreeCAD guys. You know, they're growing great guns. They've got a cool community. They've got a lot of support. You just you go there with a problem, and as long as you show that you put a little skin in the game, they'll they'll be with you to to help you through it. Uh, but when it comes to things like money and that sort of stuff. Then you have to set up a foundation, then you have to have administrative costs, and that becomes a real hassle. And so having a single source to provide that sort of umbrella is always beneficial, and that's, I think that's kind of how these sorts of things start to happen. Um, 
but it's something that I think probably a lot of open source communities are reluctant to dip their toes in because they're afraid of commercial involvement. And it's understandable because there's always that, that tension in the open source community. We should be free of any commercial interests. And others are like, no, this is, this is how stuff gets supported is with money. You know, it's, it's a hard question to answer. And I think it's really dependent upon the project as to whether or not any commercial support is acceptable or whether you get a diversity or a single source. Um, I don't really have an informed opinion, though I'd like to hear yours at some point. Yes, sir. Any institution using open source to teach engineers? Boy, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, well, that's just it, is colleges are going to educate engineers on the software that they're going to use in production. That's why you got to go with governments who go after the consultants, and then the colleges will follow suit. Otherwise, your open source in, in colleges is relegated largely, largely to academia and research projects. That's my, my experience of it. Uh, you know, you might see open source like, uh, uh, I was just trying to think, like open source text editors or, or development environments in, you know, in software engineering, they might use those, but you're not going to see, I think without a lot of production, a lot of adoption of open source in a production environment, you're not going to see it on the education side. There you go. They offer their candy cheap. <laughs> One of the advantages, though, in terms of education, when you're talking about getting open source into education, is when you're dealing with, uh, well, like the community college that's near where I live. They deal with a lot of, they have a lot of students that, you know, are, don't have a lot of money, right? And so if we can teach them how to do 3D modeling in Blender, they can leave college and they still have access to Blender. They don't have to spend money on an expensive license. And you can learn, you know, Blender will teach you everything you need to know about 3D modeling. You don't need 3D Studio Max to do it. So that is, a, that is a, a portal for, or a way to get open source into education, I think. Yes, ma'am. That's, how do you beat vendor lock-in? I wanted to say, though, from my experience, people in government, IT professionals in government, like the idea of open source. They see the ethical responsibilities of it. They, they know that it makes sense. And they would like to be able to adopt it. So it's not like they're against open source. A lot of them are not against open source on the idea of it or the value of it. They, but their hands are tied. Um, but we don't have money. Well, it's the, well, with a, from a government perspective, you know, in my and I'm talking from experience in government is is that from a government perspective, you're locked into a solution and transitioning to another solution is expensive. Now, only five minutes. Oh, okay. So transitioning to another solution is simply prohibitively expensive, especially when you are responsible for taxpayer funds. So if you spend millions and millions of dollars to transition from Microsoft Server to you know, uh, Sousa or Fedora or whatever for an enterprise solution, you're accountable to that too. Who? The general public. Now, you may not be elected by them as an IT professional, but you're still accountable for taxpayer money, and the people who clear that money are elected by them. So it's, it's a bit of a, you know, there's a bit of a challenge in that. And really, you have to sell the idea of open source as the ethical thing to do, because that's what talks to governments. That's what talks to lawyers. And lawyers are the ones that write policies in governments. Now the thing, the other, the other chink in the armor is the small governments, the ones that cannot afford those expensive licenses. Okay, you can talk to them, and they will be able to hear that and see the value of open source, and they will not be constrained. They will not be nearly as constrained as your larger government units might be. But it's it's a very big problem. I hear it. Yes, sir, I'm back. Uh huh. Right to repair. Yep. Yep. 
Right to repair is a very interesting topic, and we are seeing a number of states in the U.S. that are adopting or considering adopting right to repair bills that work in favor of the farmer that require manufacturers to allow third parties to repair equipment, like Apple tries to prevent people from doing to their iPhones and stuff, right? Uh, so that's a big thing, and I think the right to repair bills are going to be a major part of this opening of proprietary hardware and software uh, for open source or, or third party, other third party solutions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oops. My battery doesn't die on me here. Let's set up five again. There we go. In the back, yes, sir. Not necessarily. Kind of in the same way that you use Linux, but you don't really care about the kernel code. Like, how many of us here actually go check out the kernel code? I mean, I have a couple of times, just because I can, right? But for the same idea is that we know that that software is open, that the source code is visible, all right? And we can go in and we can check it. But really, when you're talking about machine learning, it's not only just the algorithm, but it's also the data. Because the data set that you use to train the algorithm is almost as valuable as the algorithm. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is the result that, that's, uh, that, that's created. The second is that data is very, very time consuming and difficult to acquire for certain things. You will spend more time acquiring data than you will developing the algorithm when it comes to machine learning, nine times out of 10, okay? So I can see then, then when you're talking about a machine learning algorithm that it's not just enough to have the algorithm but also the data set used to train the algorithm so that you can validate that the data that was included in that data set is really representative of the problem you're trying to solve. So those are the reasons why we need open data as well as, as open source. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is, is even with these predictions, these predictions are based on, these predictions are solving problems for which there are physical methods and means to solve. So even if it makes predictions and I can't tell how it makes prediction, I can check it with my own math. You know, I can't check its math, but I can check it with my own and validate it. But it's not hard to tell, not hard to see that there could come a time when we are developing increasingly complex algorithms that can see patterns in data and start to solve problems that we do not have good physical models or f good uh, 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 physical definition of the pro problem domain that we can't solve it either. So, all right, with that, I think I have to conclude this. So, thank you. stuff like that. They're oh, yeah? always looking for work, but uh, you know, they gotta build their structure so they may be open to the free cat. I'm not sure. Huh. Okay. And this person is also in the research and innovation, so Okay. As part of the university, so they're doing stuff to support the various um, maker spaces and stuff like that. So I gotcha. Open source stuff like that may be Okay, well, thank you. Somebody? <laughs> I wanted to question on another. I this mention one. one thing, question on another. One was, um, you mentioned data formats mm -hmm. and, con and specking and proprietary. 